Hello YouTube. In this video I'm going to outline the problem of specifying the boundaries of the moral domain. So the question here is what exactly is morality? What is the distinction between moral norms and non-moral norms? Uh, we do distinguish moral norms from other kinds of norms. There are etiquette norms, prudential norms, religious norms, aesthetic norms. Um, when I was a child, I recall being told by several teachers at my school that you ought not to eat with your elbows on the table. This was considered rude or disrespectful. Uh, it was not proper behaviour. Um, now, even if you conform to this particular norm, you probably don't take it to be a moral norm. Uh, it's a norm of, of etiquette. Um, or, you know, think about rules that specify appropriate forms of clothing for particular events, like the appropriate forms of clothing for a, uh, a work meeting or for a funeral. Uh, again, these don't seem to be moral rules. So <clears throat> the question is, what's the distinction between the moral, the moral norms and the other types of norms? I guess what we could broadly call the conventional norms. Um, now, note that the question here is not whether any particular rules are correct or incorrect moral rules. So when, for instance, a utilitarian uh, says that we ought to maximise happiness, we all understand that this is supposed to be a moral rule, even if we think that it's ultimately mistaken. Um, you know, we may not agree with utilitarianism, but utilitarianism is a moral theory. Um, like, it's a, it's a theory of what moral behaviour is, so it's part of the moral domain. Um, now, so, so, like, you can see, okay, you don't have to agree that some proposed moral norm is correct. The question is just whether or not it counts as a moral norm. Um, so, yeah, like, what is a moral norm? What counts as a moral theory? Um, I do want to say, before, uh, before getting into this any further, uh, I have a Patreon um, that you can sign up to if you like my work. I have a PayPal now that you can give a, just a one-off donation to. Um, I also have a have a Discord, uh, so I'll put up the link to that in the description. And I offer private tutoring. Uh, again, all of that will be in the description. I'm quite sure that my regular viewers will get very tired of me uh, saying this in every video, but uh, I think it's kind of important to advertise all of that. And you know, anything that you can do to you know any any comment or like or whatever, uh, that all helps you know, keep the, keep the channel visible. So, um, you know, I I'd appreciate uh, anything like that. Now, um, okay, so we've seen that the question here is, <clears throat> what makes a norm a moral norm? Now, before we explore some of the answers to this, it's maybe worth pausing to ask why exactly this matters. Uh, so, what difference does it make whether we take a norm to be uh, moral or non-moral? Well, this has important connections to broader debates within meta-ethics. Consider, for example, the question of whether morality is a human universal. Do all human cultures have moral codes? Is the capacity of moral judgment an evolutionary adaptation? Uh, obviously, our answer to this question will influence our assessment of evolutionary debunking arguments in meta-ethics, for example. Um, you know, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I have a video on evolutionary debunking arguments, I'll put up a link to that uh, in the comments. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, uh, until we can sort of specify what counts as a moral norm, it's not clear how to interpret variation in norms across cultures. More broadly, philosophers are interested in the semantics of moral judgments. They will ask questions like, what exactly do moral judgments mean? Do moral judgments express propositions that can be true or false, or are they expressions of non-cognitive states, like desires or emotions. You know, when I say that slavery is wrong, am I, am I like, attributing the property of wrongness to slavery, or am I just kind of expressing something more like boo to slavery? Well, it looks like to answer this kind of question, we've got to know which judgments count. Which judgments are the moral judgments? So, with all of that said, let's consider some ways of uh, delineating the moral domain. Uh, Nicholas Southwood, in his article, The Moral Conventional Distinction, suggests that we can distinguish three broad approaches to this problem. So, first of all, there is what he calls the form view. Now, on the form view, 
the difference between moral and non-moral norms is characterized purely in terms of the formal properties of the principles in question. So, for instance, one famous demarcation criterion proposed by R. M. Hare is uh, universalizability. So, uh, Hare suggested, I mean, it wasn't, actually wasn't just Hare, lots of people have suggested, um, that moral principles are supposed to apply globally in some sense. They're supposed to apply to all persons or to all rational agents. So when I make a moral judgment, I assume that all people in relevantly similar circumstances would be bound by the same obligations. When I say that it is morally wrong for Verity to steal the bread, I imply that for anybody else in a relevantly similar situation to Verity, it would also be morally wrong to steal the bread. Or if I claim that it's morally acceptable for Sydney to steal the bread, because let's say Sydney is poor and he has no other means of providing for his family, then I imply that for anybody else who is similarly poor and similarly has no other means of providing for their family, it's morally acceptable to steal the bread. Um, so the point is that for a moral judgment to be, for a judgment to be a moral judgment, I must universalize it. I must take it to apply to all agents who are in the sort of circumstances specified by the principle. Now, by contrast, conventional norms are local. They apply only to one's group or community. So maybe in England, you ought not to eat with your elbows on the table, or so I was told at any rate. But in other societies, that would be perfectly fine. Um, we don't take that as, as a universal obligation. Um, even the people who endorse this norm will recognise that it, it doesn't hold in other cultures. It's, it's a uniquely English rule of etiquette. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one sort of view of uh, demarcating moral from non-moral norms. Uh, an alternative version of the form view holds that moral norms are categorical. So that is, moral norms are those norms that hold regardless of your goals or desires or your role in any particular institution. If I take something to be a moral obligation, then I will hold that you cannot release yourself from that obligation merely by uh, changing your desires or adopting a different career or, or whatever. Uh, for instance, as a firefighter, I have a duty to enter burning buildings and save lives. But I can release myself from that obligation by just giving up the career of a firefighter. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not so keen on uh, throwing myself into burning buildings. So uh, I, I think, you know what, this, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm going to give this up and I'm no longer going to be obligated to do that. Now, by contrast, if I see a child drowning in a, in a shallow pond and I could intervene to help the child at no risk to my own life, then a lot of people would say I have a moral obligation to help. And what makes this a moral obligation is that I can't release myself from this obligation uh, no matter what I want or do. Uh, you know, it's no good saying, well, you know, I'm not employed as a firefighter. I'm not employed as a, as a paramedic. I'm, I'm, I'm just a philosopher and philosophers have no duty to intervene. No, nope. everybody has a duty to intervene. Even if you don't desire to help, even if you do not occupy a position which sets down a duty to help, still you have a duty to help. Um, that's what makes it a moral judgment. So, so when I make a moral judgment, I take the judgment to have this kind of categorical force. Um, you, you can't release yourself from the, uh, from the judgment, from the norm. Um, another formal property that has commonly been cited is that, that uh, it, it concerns the types of reactive attitudes associated with the norm. Um, in the case of moral judgments, the judger is disposed to direct blame to those who violate the norm. She is disposed to experience guilt if she violates the norm. She is disposed to feel positively towards those who conform with the norm, and so on. Now, perhaps we might say that moral judgments, um, you know, are, th are those that are felt particularly strongly. Perhaps we might say that moral, moral judgments are taken to outweigh other judgments. So like moral norms are viewed as those that outweigh all other norms. Moral norms are overriding. They override all other considerations. With conventional judgments, by contrast, the associated reactive attitudes are different. 
I might feel shame or embarrassment for violating a conventional norm if I wear inappropriate clothing to a formal meeting. Yeah, that's gonna... Um, I might, I might, yeah, feel embarrassed about that. But I won't feel full-blown guilt. Um, and when I see somebody else violate a conventional norm, maybe I disapprove of their behaviour in some way, but it's not going to be as strong as in the moral case. And, you know, with, with a conventional norm, I, I might be more likely to just laugh at them or something. You know, again, if somebody comes to a work meeting wearing a bikini or something like that, then, I mean, it's more, like, cringy or funny than it is, uh, it, you know, you're not so much inclined to blame them. Um, so, it, you, you know, so that's uh, so maybe we can understand this in terms of the sort of set of emotional attitudes that are associated with each norms. Uh, in any case, the point is that on the form view, we draw the uh, moral, non-moral distinction purely in terms of the formal properties of the norms. Uh, we don't need to know anything about the content of the norms. We don't need to any. We don't need to know anything about the kind of actions that the norms either forbid or permit. Uh, so one way to think about this is that on the form view, in principle, anything could be moralised. Anything could become a moral principle. Um, so we take it to be purely conventional that you ought not to eat with your elbows on the table. But another society could take this to be a moral principle. There could be a society where people, you know, universalise this or they take it to have categorical force or it's associated with reactive attitudes like guilt and blame. And in that case, it would be a moral judgment. So let's have a look at this at the second approach, the uh, what Southwood calls the content view. On the content view, the difference between moral and non-moral norms is characterized in terms of the substantive content of the norms, the kind of actions that each norm requires. Um, so the content view is is narrower than the form view in the According to the content view, not just any norm could become a moral norm. Even if it had all of the formal properties that we described previously, uh, some norms just have the wrong kind of content. So, you know, the norm against uh, eating with your elbows on the table, that just couldn't, that's just not a moral norm, uh, regardless of whether it's universalized or taken to have categorical force or whatever. So what sort of content exactly might distinguish morality? Well, one suggestion is that moral norms involve a requirement of impartiality. That is, moral norms involve the impartial consideration of the interests of others. Conventional normative judgments, by contrast, concern actions that are of interest only to specific social groups. Unfortunately, it can be tricky to spell out what impartiality amounts to. Um, so. We often take it that we have special obligations to specific people. I might say, for instance, that I have special obligations to those that I love. I ought to act with special consideration for those that I love. Uh, if somebody that I love is, you know, in need of a kidney, then, you know, maybe I, maybe I should give a kidney to them um, if it's somebody who's particularly important to me or, or whatever. Whereas, you know, I'm not obligated to uh, give the kidney just to any random person, right? Like, I don't act impartially there. If I'm thinking of giving a kidney away, I'm not going to be acting impartially. And that seems like it. there might be a, a sort of moral, um, a moral force to that, that like morally, um, we, we, I, I ought to have special concern for the people that I love. Um, now, of course, we might say, well, everybody else has such special obligations as well, but then that now looks like the merely formal constraint of universalizability. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, impartiality, this might be one way of understanding the content, um, but working out what exactly impartiality amounts to, uh, if not just universalizability, uh, is, is a bit tricky. So another suggestion is that moral norms are other regarding. Uh, moral norms require us to perform or to refrain from actions that have a bearing on the interests uh, or rights of other beings. Uh, it, it, in the moral domain, the interests and rights of other beings are at stake. Their interest in being free from harm, their interest in being free from coercion, their interest in being treated fairly. Um, and so, so morality is 
fundamentally social, right? It's a it's a concern with rights or justice, broadly speaking. It's 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 a it's fundamentally social. And one motivation for this kind of view comes from reflection on the origin and function of morality. So, arguably, uh, there's a plausible story to be told that morality is a tool that arose in order to solve social problems. Um, morality aids social coordination. It's, it promotes peace and well-being among the members of a society. Jesse Prins in The Emotional Construction of Morals puts it this way, and I quote, Why do we have moral values? The obvious answer is that morality emerges as a system of rules for getting people to function collectively in stable and productive ways. We have morality to build a coherent social group. Moral values lead us to cooperate and prevent us from harming members of our communities. So, you know, the, like the point of morality is this kind of peace, well-being, social coordination. So morality is fundamentally social. So moral norms are those norms that are, are like concerned with the interests of others. Morality is other regarding. Um, actually, so uh, this quote from Prinz also suggests another proposal for uh, what the content of moral norms might be, and that's that moral norms are those that are concerned specifically with well-being versus harm. So it is because everybody has the capacity to impose harms on others, uh, and indeed impose harms on themselves, in conjunction with the desire to be free from harm that leads to the development of moral norms. Violating conventional norms might lead to distress of some sort, but it won't be seen as actually harming anybody. So it's not proper behaviour to eat with one's elbow on the table. Uh, certainly not proper behaviour to turn up to a formal meeting in a bikini. Still, nobody is actually hurt by either of these things. Um, so maybe harm is what uh, distinguishes the moral from the non-moral norms. However, um, so arguably these forms, uh, the, these versions of the content view may be too narrow. Um, so one thing to consider here is that many societies have apparently moral norms that prohibit practices that are not obviously other regarding or connected to harm. For instance, there are many societies where there are norms against masturbation or certain types of sexual perversion um, that a person might engage in just on their own. Um, uh, well, that doesn't seem to have you know, anything to do with other people or doesn't seem to have anything to do with harm. Um, I mean, at least prima facie, these norms concern the conduct of an individual towards herself. Now, in defence of the content view, it might be said that even with these norms, the justification for the norm will usually appeal to harm. So in the past, there was a norm against masturbation because masturbation was believed to cause mental illness, uh, to lead to just generally deviant behaviour. Um, the more liberal attitudes to sexuality that we have today have followed from a better understanding of human sexual behaviour. We now see masturbation as perfectly healthy and normal, so we no longer have a norm against it. Um, but like that's why we no longer have a norm against it, because we now recognise that it's not harmful. Um, so, you know, uh, it, you know, actually, yes, there are lots of norms that um, are not obviously connected to harm or that are not obviously connected to like regard for others, but um, the, a lot of that kind of depends on one's background factual beliefs. Um, However, there is some uh, empirical research that uh, suggests that actually, no, um, not all of uh, a person's moral judgments will be based on considerations of, of harm or considerations of others. Um, so most famously, the work of uh, Jonathan Haidt and colleagues reported in, for instance, the article uh, Affect Culture and Morality. Um, participants from America and Brazil were given a series of uh, short stories describing tra transgressions that evoked disgust or that violated norms relating to uh, sanctity, authority and purity. So here are a few of the stories they are presented with. Um, number one, a woman is cleaning out her closet and she finds her old American or Brazilian flag, depending on whether this was given to an American or Brazilian participant. 
She doesn't want the flag anymore, so she cuts it up into pieces and uses the rags to clean her bathroom. Number two, a family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They had heard that dog meat was delicious, so they cut up the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. Number three, a man goes to a supermarket once a week and buys a dead chicken. But before cooking the chicken, he has sexual intercourse with it. Then he cooks it and eats it. So participants were given these stories and then they were asked whether the action was wrong. Uh, and then, they, if they judged that the action was wrong, they were asked to justify this. Justify why the action was wrong. And they were also asked explicitly whether anybody was hurt by the action. Now, the interesting thing is that many of the participants agreed that the conduct in these cases was not harmful. So nobody's actually harmed by the actions. Um, and even when harm was cited, it was usually harm to oneself. So, I don't know, maybe the man who has sex with the chicken is harming himself. Um, but, you know, actually many of them agreed that there's not, there's not any harm here. However, many of these participants still judged the actions to be wrong. And they judged them to be wrong universally. So they judged that it, it would be wrong for anybody to eat their dog, regardless of what society they were in, regardless of yeah, the social circumstances. So they universalized the, uh, the judgment. Um, Height and colleagues found significant cross-cultural variation in moral attitudes. Among Philadelphians of high socioeconomic status, most participants exhibited a harm-based morality. Uh, so they were much less likely to judge that the actions in questions were wrong. And when judging them to be wrong, they would try to justify their judgment by appealing to harm. So it seems that among high socioeconomic status people in Philadelphia, um, disgusting and disrespectful actions were not moralized. By contrast, in groups of lower socioeconomic status and among Brazilians, um, the actions in these stories were judged to be morally wrong even when they were perceived to be harmless. Uh, so all that mattered is that the behaviours were considered disgusting or disrespectful. Um, in that case, they were taken to be morally prohibited. Um, so, I mean, this uh, raises some challenges, perhaps, to uh, these versions of the content view. But it's worth noting that it also raises a, a more general challenge uh, to any attempt to delineate the boundaries of morality. Um, so what is suggested by this research, I mean, at least one way of looking at this research, is that maybe moral concepts vary across different cultural groups. Perhaps there isn't one thing, morality, right? There's, so there's no one way to demarcate the boundary between moral and non-moral norms. Um, if so, then there may just be no general no general analysis of the moral domain. Like, okay, maybe if we focus on group X, we can indeed analyze moral norms as those norms that are other regarding and that are concerned with harm and well-being. Um, but that definition will just fail to capture moral concepts used in other societies. Um, there might not be any, like, one single way of uh, drawing the boundaries here. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a, 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 a very general concern about the, the whole project. Um, but uh, I guess before accepting defeat, let's, uh, let's outline one more approach. Um, this is the uh, grounds view, uh, what, what Southwood calls the grounds view. And um, this is the view that is favoured by uh, Nicholas Southwood himself in his article. Um, so to motivate this position, Southwood begins with the following example. You make a, a seemingly moral judgment, such as that people must not commit murder. You are then asked to defend this judgment. Now, suppose you have the following dialogue. So, A asks, why do you think that people must not commit murder? And then you respond, well, because murder is just not done around here. So Southwood says that this just doesn't seem like a genuine moral judgment because the mere fact that it is an accepted social practice not to murder is irrelevant to the moral status of murder. What is done around here is the wrong kind of thing to appeal to. Uh, I mean, at least if the goal is to give a moral justification. Uh, like, so, you, you know, if, if somebody were to give this answer to the question, 
we would think that they had just missed the point, right? Like it, it would be, it would be kind of baffling. It would be puzzling, right? Like, like what? You know, like that just misses the point. You've misunderstood what's uh, what's wrong with murder, right? Um, because we, so you ought not to commit murder. We take that to be a moral matter. Like that's a moral judgment for us. Um, and to say that, well, you know, the reason why you ought not to do that is just because that's just not the way we do things. Um, that seems to uh, fail to, it's just the wrong kind of reason, right? By contrast, consider conventional judgments. So you're about to go to a funeral with your child who is upset to learn that everybody is required to wear black. So child says like, hey, why do you think that people must wear black to funerals? And you respond, well, because wearing black at funerals is just what we do. Now, in this case, Southwood says, the answer is pretty sensible. Um, and the reason is because in justifying conventional norms, it's enough to appeal to the practices of the community to which we belong. Um, that's just part of what it is to make a conventional normative judgment. Okay, so with this in mind then, uh, the, what the grounds view says is that the moral conventional distinction is drawn based on whether social practices are part of what grounds the judgment. Um, as Southwood puts it, and I quote, moral judgments are normative judgments that may not be grounded even in part in presumed social practice. Uh, so like grounding on social practice is incompatible with moral judgment. Moral judgments are practice independent. By contrast, Southwood says, conventional judgments are necessarily grounded, at least in part, in presumed social practices. And that's why it's perfectly acceptable to respond when challenged to justify a conventional judgment. It's perfectly acceptable to respond, well, that's just the way it's done around here. Um, now, it's important to clarify that the grounds view takes it that in conventional judgments, social practices must play a non-derivative justificatory role. Social practices may still play a derivative role in moral judgments. So to clarify this point, um, consider this example. Verity is a thrill seeker. Uh, so she decides that she's going to start driving on the left side of the road. Um, she lives in a country where the convention is to drive on the right, but she decides because she's a thrill seeker, she's going to drive on the left. Sydney observes this and he judges that Verity acts wrongly. Now, surely this is a moral judgment. Um, I mean, at least it could be a moral judgment. Yet this judgment is grounded on a social practice, the practice of driving on the right side of the road. Um, this social practice developed in order to solve a coordination problem. Um, you know, roads were in chaos for a long time and, you know, they like either left or right will be fine. Okay, it doesn't really matter which one we choose, but we've got to choose one of them, right? You drive on the left or the right, that makes everything more smooth, makes, makes everything more efficient. Um, but because there is now this convention of driving on the right, all drivers are morally obligated to drive on the right. So driving on the right is just a matter of convention. Could have, could have been left. Left is fine too. But once you've decided on driving on the right, you're now morally obligated to do that. So it looks like the moral judgment is grounded in a social practice or social convention, the social convention of driving on the right. In this case, however, the justificatory role of the convention of driving on the right is derivative of a more fundamental principle. So the, prin the more fundamental principle is something like this. You ought not to drive in ways that endanger other people's lives. The kind of driving behavior that endangers lives will depend on which driving conventions are in force. So this is why the specific driving conventions matter to Sydney's judgment, right? Like actually, uh, it, they're just playing a a derivative role. Um, it, it, what what's what really matters here is the, the the fundamental principle that you ought not to drive in ways that endanger other people's lives. And if you were to give a justification for that, you wouldn't appeal to social practices, or so Southwood says. Now, compare this to the conventional rule that you ought not to eat with your elbows on the table. Why? Well. 
that's just the way things are done around here. Um, and that's it. And in, in that case, the social practice plays a non-derivative role in justifying the judgment. So the grounds view. Um, we might argue that the grounds view provides the best of both worlds with respect to the form and content views. Um, we saw that the content view is appealing to a lot of people because it squares well with a plausible story about the origin of morality and its function within society. Uh, morality does seem, prima facie, to be, um, you know, sort of, it, it, the point of it, perhaps, seems to be, you know, about organising and coordinating social behaviour in such a way as to promote social flourishing. Um, however, we've seen also that many groups will moralise behaviours that don't involve other people and that are not even thought to be harmful to anybody. Well, the grounds view promises to accommodate this, um, both of these points. So, when people judge it to be wrong for a man to have sex with a dead chicken, um, it may well be that the justification for this does not appeal to any specific social practices. In fact, it would perhaps be kind of odd if if you were to justify it by appealing to social practices. So, like, consider this dialogue. Um, why was it wrong for the man to have sex with a dead chicken? Well, because having sex with dead chickens is just not done around here. Um, well, you know, maybe that maybe that sounds a bit a bit strange, right? Um, indeed, many of the participants who were given the chicken story uh, universalized the judgment, as as I, as we saw earlier. So they would say that it's wrong in every society to have sex with a dead chicken. Doesn't it doesn't matter how things are done around here. It's just wrong to have sex with dead chickens. That's it. Um, so. The thought is, look, maybe the situation is something like this. Um, in conventional judgments, social practices are simply taken for granted. We accept a social practice and then we use that social practice as the standard by which to judge behaviour. By contrast, since the point of morality is to promote peace, cooperation, social coordination and so on, Morality is at least partly concerned with assessing social practices. So social practices themselves come under the eye of morality. They are subject to social assessment. As such, they are not simply taken for granted when we engage in moral thinking. Uh, so in other words, the proposal is that there is this domain of judgment, morality, um, which emerged in order to ensure social stability uh, or whatever else, you know, promote cooperation, promote peace, whatever else. Um, and then as such, when making moral judgments, social practices are not simply taken for granted. Social practices are themselves assessed by morality because social practices, particular social practices, can promote or undermine social stability. Particular social practices can be more or less conducive to peace. Um, they can be more or less, you know, efficient and so on. Um, so this, like, capacity of moral judgment assesses social practices as well. But then this capacity for assessing social practices can appeal to all kinds of considerations, right? Not, not just kind of harm um, and not just considerations having to do with the interests of others. And this is why we find people moralizing behaviors that do not involve others or that do not involve harm. Um, if I judge that people ought not to do something, you know, if I judge that people ought not to have sex with dead chickens, simply because I find having sex with dead chickens disgusting or disrespectful, that's a moral judgment because it doesn't appeal to social practice. Instead, it's, it's actually kind of being used to assess social practices. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that's uh, the sort of line that somebody who endorses the ground view might take. Of course, this is just a suggestion. Much more work would need to be done to provide, you know, empirical support for this. Moreover, there are concerns about the ground view. Um, so here's, here's, I suppose, one, one major objection to the ground's view. So, arguably, most people, when they make moral judgments, do not have any particular grounds in mind that justify those judgments. Uh, the grounds view seems to rest on a kind of rationalist conception of moral judgment, where people 
first assess the evidence in light of some moral theory they accept, and then they make a judgment that they consider to be justified. So like when somebody encounters an action, such as the action of a person having sex with a dead chicken, well, you know, they kind of weigh up the different considerations, they sort of consider that in light of some, you know, moral framework or moral theory, and then that leads them to make a judgment about the action. So moral judgment is a product of moral reasoning. There are significant challenges to this view. Um, again, th these come most famously from uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, see, for instance, the paper, The Emotional Dog and Its Rational Tail. So on, on Haidt's model, um, most moral judgments are automatic and, and intuitive. They're triggered by emotional factors like disgust or anger or by cultural conventions. And then reasoning only occurs after the fact. People, you know, people have these immediate emotional reactions and then they construct these post hoc rationalizations. So reasoning about morality is often analogous not to an impartial judge weighing the evidence, but to a lawyer doing its best to build a case for a client. Um, you know, a lawyer who like has a conclusion that they want to argue for, and then they're just going to do everything they can to uh, to defend that conclusion. Um, so on this model, people will often not have any particular grounds for their moral judgments. Um, they just have immediate reactions, and then. In the face of requests for justification, they might appeal to just about any ground imaginable, um, including to the claim, you know, including to the claim that the behaviour that they've judged to be wrong is just not done around here. Um, so yeah, I mean, if this kind of model is is right, uh, uh, then maybe we have uh, some challenges there for the grounds view. Um, Anyway, uh, that is all for today. Um, thanks for watching. Goodbye.